Hey, I'm Ron Rayner. Uh, we have a family farm uh, operation here. We operate as a tumbling tea ranches, and uh, I have two brothers, Robert and Earl, uh, and two nephews, uh, John and Perry, that are involved in the operation. Uh, and we're just uh, a little bit southwest of Goodyear is our headquarters, and we have. Uh, operations also down further southwest out in the desert and then uh, we also have some uh, property in California that we uh, have some permanent crops on the east side of the valley east of X. What we're doing here uh, today that I want to show you is some of the work that we've done on uh, planting cotton uh, into the standing stubble of, of wheat uh, and it's a key ingredient in a complete rotation program that we have developed over the last 20 years. Uh, and so our water salinity here is fairly high. Uh, we have around 2,500 parts per million at the best. Uh, and at times it, it's been much higher than that. But uh, we figured out this system by converting all of our uh, farmland into a border flood system. A lot of people say, oh, well, especially people that don't know, they say that, well, that's a uh, border flood is a wasteful uh, system for water efficiency. And we find the exact opposite is true, that we're much more efficient with border flood. And we've learned a little better how to, uh, how to maintain that efficiency because we we make our borders a little smaller so that we can push the water out faster. And so we, uh, as soon as we get the water to the other end of the field, or just before it gets to the other end of the field, we change, we shut it off. You know, you change it. So we run very little water off of the field, and as long as we can cover it very quickly, then we can uh, uh, not exceed uh, you know the depths of penetration that we really want. But what we've evolved in the system is a is a it's no-till part of the time especially when we plant cotton and forage sorghum and then the other is uh, uh, we do have a minimum till then when we go from cotton back to uh, wheat we'll do a single pass tillage and then uh, also when we're coming out of forage sorghum into alfalfa, we'll do that with a single pass tillage. So there's only a few times when we really till, but our basic rotation is is three years of alfalfa, and we keep roughly half the farm in alfalfa, and then the other half would be in wheat. And uh, then when we harvest the wheat, which is uh, today, which is uh, the 15th or so of uh, of uh, uh, May, then we're already harvesting, and we uh, and we deliberately uh, shape our uh, farming practices to try to make this wheat as early as we can make it come off. We even use varieties that are a tad shorter in maturity than others. And when I say wheat, this is all Durham, because we can uh, get contracts for Durham. Price is not as good this year as it has been, but. Uh, hey, uh, <laughs> things change. But well, let me just indicate that in this uh, location here, we just uh, finished harvesting this a couple of days ago. Uh, we had the no-till planter right behind it. It's a little bit hard to tell, but that's already been planted. And then over the weekend, we irrigated that. So uh, it's, it should be ready to come up here any day. But uh, these fields... Uh, you know, we push them as hard as we can to gain every day that we can because here we are uh, beginning to plant. We actually planted some a little bit earlier, but uh, somewhere around the 10th of May is about as early as we can do it. And we hope for higher temperatures. It's been strange the last two years, and this year is no exception, we've had some cool weather in May. We actually had some higher temperatures back earlier. But this does delay us a little bit. So that's one of the reasons we we're interested in, in strip tilling, uh, thinking that if we could strip till that, we might uh, create a little warmer conditions on the soil that it'll warm up a little faster. All right. 
but uh, we have learned a lot of things about how to handle our rotation. Uh, for instance, when we come out of uh, the cotton, you know, we're running the cotton harvesters and right behind it we're running the shredders. Uh, you know, it was a common practice for a lot of growers to run a ground uh, pickup machines called a rood uh, to pick up any lost cotton that falls on the ground. Well, we just bypass that operation 100% because we, uh, one, we have still have straw laying on the ground underneath the cotton plants, so uh, that wouldn't work anyway. But we find that we lose very little cotton because it's held still tightly on the plant. We have such a compact season uh, in growing our cotton. And it works very well because our cotton quality is very high, uh, higher than we ever grow in full season. So it, uh, it's been a, uh, an interesting uh, 20 years basically in figuring out how to do this, but we've developed a pattern now that we have uh, standard operating procedures that we use. And a little bit of it we do by the calendar. And we found that uh, you know, dealing with uh, university extension uh, uh, personnel, especially one that is very interesting to work with, uh, is our extension uh, uh, meteorologist. And uh, he has done a lot of calculations and trends, and he shows that even though we really haven't had hotter summers here, uh, and actually he confirms that the spring has been a little bit cooler. But the main factor that allows us to do this is we have warm falls. Uh, the last several years, we have a trend that uh, the temperatures stay higher longer into the fall. That's really been allowing us to mature these crops, uh, especially uh, you know to get this cotton to finish out. But uh, anyway, the the rotation that we've developed uh, works very well for us here at this location because we've got. A very limited number of crops that we can grow because they have to be salinity tolerant. And by planting in the uh, border flood system, not only is it very efficient, but we're able to uniformly leach salts and keep them moving down. Uh, and it's just a very good uh, pattern because it's common, you know, this uh, Durham wheat, we have to apply a bloom stage uh, shot of nitrogen to get the protein up. And that's part of the university recommendations is to put on a, a fairly substantial uh, uh, application of nitrogen. And you know that late in the season, it's not all going to be used. And it's one of the things that we see when we plant this cotton. By the time the cotton gets about six inches tall, it just seems to take off. And we believe it's maybe tapping into a little nitrogen down there. And it requires very little nitrogen to make the cotton crop. Uh, we usually uh, we'll just take a spreader and run over the field and throw 100 to 150 pounds of urea over the top of it and then water it in. And uh, then we don't always, but some fields require a little more. We may water run some UN32, uh, but no more than 15 to 20 gallons. And so the combination of those two uh, and Last year was our best yielding year overall because uh, we averaged over 1,750 pounds of lint on the entire crop. And last year we had about 800 acres uh, of uh, cotton, a little over 850, I guess, uh, behind uh, Durham wheat. And, uh, you know, and the Durham wheat averaged over 7,000 pounds, 7,100 pounds. So, uh, you know, financially it's a, it's a good move. Uh, because you're spending very little time in the field with tractors. Uh, we don't cultivate the fields at all. Uh, we do use a double shot usually of Roundup, and that's the only time we use Roundup on the fields in the entire rotation is those two years that we do the double crop cotton. Uh, and then we use different chemistries, of course, on all of the other crops, uh, completely different chemistries. So. We think it's been key in helping uh, to avert any resistance uh, in in weeds, because in this area there has there have been uh, some resistant uh, weeds come up, and 
we may see that challenge a little more this year because we've taken on quite a few acres that are new to us uh, you know, in this year. So uh, let's see if we can't figure out a way to grow cotton that makes sense uh, from a production cost of production standpoint. And that first year, I remember our thinking was that, you know, if we can if we can do this double crop thing and make a thousand pounds of lint and uh, and keep our costs way down, which we were, were doing, that in that first year, I think we spent, we had $380 an acre in variable costs. Of course, that was before cotton seed went to 350 or $400 a bag. <laughs> but still, we, we were encouraged by that and we made two bales. And uh, since that time, each year, we we do a variety trial with the university uh, here on this farm, and uh, we've uh, even held field days uh, twice a year, once in the early season and then again in the fall, just uh, at for the harvest time to let people take a look at all those varieties. And uh, it, it's interesting because a lot of the newer varieties uh, really have a lot of yield potential in, uh, in a very compact period of time. As a matter of fact, I got some of the idea from watching guys uh, farming in California. I just was amazed that some of those acala varieties had the potential to set as much cotton as they do in a very short period of time. So it, uh, you know, made us think that, well, gosh, maybe there's a way that we can make this work. And of course, having uh, the ability to control growth with their growth regulators and having the uh, the no-till capability with with Roundup Ready plants so that after we plant the cotton we don't uh, till it at all. Several of the things that we learned uh, early on uh, we had a gosh a researcher Dr. John Bradley did you, you know I can't recall where he worked it but he came out from Tennessee, and I think that he was working with uh, a university, and then he went to work for uh, Monsanto or somebody. But I know he came out and because uh, we wanted to plant it, we had purchased a no-till type planter, and we really didn't know how to work it or set it up or anything. And uh, after we harvested some of that wheat the first time went out there in the field and said, well, how do we do this? And he said, well, just plant it. And I said, well, do we need to do this? He said, just plant it. <laughs> and so after about three times, we decided, okay, we'll go plant it. And we just poked the seed in the ground and started the water. And, you know, growing up in an ir on an irrigated farm, one of the worst things you could ever do is to get the water over the top of newly planted cotton because it would crust it and the cotton would never make it out of the ground. So we were presuming the hardest thing was going to be getting a cotton stand and it turned out that that was not the case at all. Uh, any place where we plant into this uh, residue, uh, we, we get a stand. That's usually the, the least of our concern is getting a stand. And so, but one of the things that we did find was that the height of the straw, because that very first year or two, we planted it right into the full height of the straw right behind the planter, but it tended to not set a fruiting form until it got above the height of the straw, so it delayed fruiting somewhat. And uh, so one of the things that we did then was uh, uh, shortening the straw by uh, shredding it. We still wanted to keep all the material on the field. And some years even, we've baled straw off. I mean, that's another operation that's just, you know, like a fire drill trying to get everything uh, going out there because we don't want to kill any more than two or three days worth of time getting all that, that straw off of the field. So we'd rather not do that. We'd really rather keep all of that material on the field because in general, the straw doesn't give you hardly any return anyway and if we're pulling all those nutrients off the field we'd be better off to leave it there but anyway that was one of the things we did is we shortened the straw and then over time running these variety trials really taught us a lot about the 
the plants because we initially would grow the shorter season varieties and some of them would be the shortest season and uh, we during these variety trials we had uh, you know the the seed companies picked the varieties that they wanted so anyway a lot of those plants were the longer maturing ones and lo and behold virtually every year since then that we've been doing the trials the longer season varieties have been the highest yielding and we like them much better because a lot of times they will set a note or two higher than some of the very early maturing varieties and when we're harvesting on the flat like that you know your picker is not going to get right down on the ground anyway and so we really don't want a fruit form that's uh, any lower to the ground than a foot because you're essentially just not going to harvest it if you if you do that uh you know the the best thing that i could see is uh, the way that so much wheat is harvested for forage uh, i think it would be difficult in the central valley to do what we're doing here and actually harvesting for grain uh, because it just takes a a lot longer in the Central Valley to get the moisture out of that grain to get it harvested. But to see all those fields being chopped, as a matter of fact, I've been pushing hard uh, to get dairymen here to buy wheat that same way. Uh, we had one farm that for two years in a row we were uh, selling forage wheat and uh, then this last year, the guy didn't want to pay as much for it, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to get them to, you know, you still have to look at the profitability of it. And so, uh, anyway, we uh, would like to do that, but but the way they're plant, uh, harvesting that wheat in California, uh, I think it, and I see that they're planting a lot of corn behind it, but you could plant cotton just as well, I believe. The only problem might be is that there's not as much uh, surface flood irrigation, basically. I guess wherever they're growing the wheat that way, it probably would work. I mean, it, they do have surface flood for those fields. But uh, we wanted to plant cotton in the border flood system. And if you plant it on bare dirt, it doesn't work very well. That ground will crust like crazy. Okay, now this is a field uh, of killed wheat. Another, this is a field that we obtained fairly late in the season. The prior tenant had uh, plowed it, and so we didn't get possession until after the first of the year. Uh, we had come in and do the basic groundwork, and then we put it into borders and lasered it in. Uh, and then you didn't have enough time to make a full fledged wheat crop so we planted it with some uh, inexpensive seed uh, and let it get up about six inches or a little bigger and then killed it and then planted cotton into that field and because we wanted to uh, gain basically a year on, on getting the work done because now it's already to follow our pattern with. We like to have the killed wheat because it's a very difficult to get a stand of cotton planted into bare dirt. Uh, if you've got organic matter, then you can uh, you can make it happen. Yes. And the other thing is, is that as we harvest that crop, and this is a key key element, uh, the day that we harvest that cotton, uh, two days later we'll be planting wheat back on it. I mean, it, the turn is very, very fast because all we have to do is shred the stalks, throw fertilizer on it, and then run the finishing ripper, the one pass tillage, and the drill is well. It, what it is is that, you know, we, we wanted to plant cotton in the border flood system. And if you plant it on bare dirt, it doesn't work very well. That ground will crust like crazy. If you can look in that field over there, you can see the little green lines. Now this is a field uh, of killed wheat. Another, this is a field that we obtained fairly late in the season. The prior tenant had uh, plowed it, and so we didn't get possession until after the first of the year. 
and we had come in and do the basic groundwork and then we put it into borders and lasered it in uh, and then you didn't have enough time to make a full fledged wheat crop so we planted it with some uh, inexpensive seed uh, and let it get up about six inches or a little bigger and then killed it and then planted cotton into that field and because we wanted to uh, gain basically a year on, on getting the work done because now it's already to follow our pattern with. We like to have the killed wheat because it's a very difficult to get a stand of cotton planted into bare dirt. Uh, if you've got organic matter, then you can uh, you can make it happen. That's and the other thing is is that as we harvest that crop, and this is a key key element, uh, the day that we harvest that cotton, uh, two days later we'll be planting wheat back on it. I mean, it, the turn is very, very fast because all we have to do is shred the stalks, throw fertilizer on it, and then run the finishing ripper, the one-pass tillage, and the drill is right behind it, and you're done. Well, you know, I guess that we stayed with this idea, and really, I think we've really figured out a way that, that it works and that it that it's profitable. Uh, to me, that is one of the things that's still just amazing to me. I can't believe it when I go out and I look at uh, a field and see little strips of cotton coming up right in in a field of straw. <laughs> and the big thing that uh, we've been amazed at, and it, it really wasn't evident in the first few years because we were still trying to figure out how to make things work, but we don't use as much water now as we did then. And I have worked with, uh, again, Dr. Brown, Paul Brown, and of course our main extensionist is uh, Dr. Uh, Ayman Mustafa, and you know he's really encouraged us and done a lot of work on trying to evaluate some of these things. But Dr. Brown, is trying to figure out a little bit about why it is that we would use less water. I mean, one, we have to be efficient. There's no question in the application. But uh, he's made up a, a little chart that he tracked the uh, evapotranspiration rate of the two crops, of the wheat and of the cotton. And it's kind of an interesting little chart because what it shows is that uh, the ET for the wheat, of course, falls like a rock in April as we're as finishing uh, maturity. And so the ET is virtually nothing until late June, which early June especially is our highest ET whenever temperatures sh spike. And then they, uh, uh, we also have our lowest humidity. We'll have days at a time with single digit humidities and so the ETs are quite high but we hardly have a plant out there that's big enough to even uh, have any, enough leaves to cause any evapotranspiration so uh, he has this chart that shows well and, and the peak ET of our cotton crop comes after the peak ET of the season and so our big plant is not even, uh, you know, doing all its work <laughs> until after the ET season is over. So by having the combination of these two crops, we're actually using no more than the amount of water used that we always used in the past for a single crop of cotton. And so, you know, we, we didn't believe that we could ever get... Uh, yields that like we're able to get as a matter of fact in the in the variety trials the last several years uh, the leading variety uh, in those trials uh, would be right at 2,000 pounds of lint so uh, you know it's a little harder to do that on a, a farm scale uh, because of some of the variation in these fields but 
when you're comparing all these varieties uh, side to side uh, to always have one or two that'll be up in that 2,000 pound category is to me just shocking. I had no idea that you know that was possible. But, but one of the, the things that I think is important is that you know we were we were taking some risks for a number of years. Uh, we feel like it's much less risky now because of what we've seen that we can accomplish. But uh, one of the things that would be helpful is for the university system and uh, uh, the researchers to be able to do some of the groundwork, uh, you know, in figuring out how to adapt a lot of uh, vegetable growth uh, for uh, no, in no-till situations. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't lost on me the, the watching those guys, our tenants there in California, uh, where they would have a crop on top of those tomato beds and just lightly incorporate it in and then plant their next crop on that. I mean, where they've got buried drip you don't have the luxury of doing a bunch of tillage you can't and so uh, that that's kind of a clue right there and and I think that transplanting especially gives uh, a lot of uh, uh, capability of putting you know these vegetables into the ground that might not be very finely prepared and uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it, the key thing that that I see here in the, in this cotton production is having that all that organic matter on top of the soil and lightly incorporated in the top three inches. I firmly believe it cools the soil, and uh, I've tried to get a few basic researchers to come out and put a few sensors around and, and improve or disprove <laughs> this deal. Uh, Dr. Brown had a unit out in one of our fields several years ago, and I still remember his comments uh, about uh, your fields are very cool. And, uh, you know, and I didn't think that much about it until we were working on some of these water related things. I said, well, you know, God, it would just make sense that the ET would be lower on the same stage of growth, even if the air temperature around those plants and down low off of the soil if the soil never heats up. As a matter of fact, we found that that's a bit of a problem in getting our crop up and growing even in May when we hope the temperatures are going to be approaching 100 degrees. Uh, you know, those soils are cool. So you have to look at that as an advantage as well. Well, I absolutely think that what we're doing is beneficial to the soil and you know as an Arizona grower uh, most of my life you know if anybody had asked me I'd tell them well we don't care what the soil is so that's just something to hold the roots. Uh, we move along through this program I, I, my thinking has changed uh, by having higher residual organic levels really covers up a lot of problems with applied fertilizers and things so that you're your soil, you know, insect relationships, uh, uh, you know, things are way different. Uh, e even when we're planting alfalfa, uh, you know, we've seen some benefits from having uh, uh, microorganisms uh, applied. I remember, still remember some tests that we had done a few years ago that uh, really improved uh, root length and size early in the season. And now we kind of believe that one of the things that we're doing, we're turning these crops so quickly that our soils never have a chance to fully dry out. If they dry out, they're only on the surface, like when we're getting ready to harvest wheat. Uh, but it maintains some moisture down there, so I think we're keeping our organisms alive. And uh, we see, uh, you know, just a lot better uh, water use, uh, productivity, uh, you know, works uh, so much better. We we try to uh, manage our in our inputs so that we're we're not over applying fertilizer certainly because it's expensive. But by keeping those residues on the field as much as we can, 
you're hauling less stuff off, so you have to haul less stuff in. We do use a little bit of manure whenever we get an opportunity. We've got a couple of dairies that uh, are close by, uh, and so a lot of times we'll, like when we're coming out of alfalfa, we'll uh, throw manure on it just before we run the, the minimum till system over it and plant wheat. But our when we're doing the one pass tillage before we plant alfalfa, it looks kind of ugly. I mean, that's one of the things you have to do is develop a thick skin and not worry about having one of those fields out next to the road, you know, where your neighbors might see it. <laughs> but that, uh, uh, you know, roughness of the soil actually turns out to be an advantage. But we do plant our alfalfa with a drill because the the seed bed is not fine enough to plant with something like a brilliant. Uh, it's a little, a little tough to do that. So we, having the seed in a little, on a six inch strip, you know, between the, the drill openers, a little more concentrated, and uh, but it it grows incredibly well. One of the things I've just been amazed at: we usually never ever plant alfalfa after cotton because it's so late in the season, you don't have a chance to get much growth. But this field here has already been cut twice, and this was planted after cotton. And we just went in with that one pass tillage and drilled her alfalfa seed in it. And uh, by golly, it just it came out and grew. And the key was that, that this field is very flat. You'd, have, you'd worry about flooding it, you know, killing it. And so, but after that first irrigation, it never needed anymore. Uh, the condition of the soil is such that you've got so much uh, organic matter in it, it keeps it from uh, uh, crusting over as badly and, and supplying those new little plants with moisture. Uh, you don't have to irrigate it back. And so I was just amazed at how well it grew. Of course, this last winter we actually had a couple of rains too, so <laughs> maybe that was a bigger help than Here you can still see some organic matter from prior crops in there. But this, uh, especially in the surface, one of the things that uh, Sam, Dr. Wang did before he left Arizona, you know, he was over at Holville for a while working for UC California. He did a, uh, a few soil tests around, pulled samples all over our farm here and then some off of our neighbors and then some down at the Maricopa Ag Center at the U of A. And his analysis showed that our soil organic matter levels were around two and a half percent and virtually all our neighbors and the university were less than a half a percent. And so it's it's really you know, invigorated these soils. I think, you know, there's a, must be a piece of a cotton stalk and it's just like a piece of sponge. So it's been in the ground for six or eight months now. But the deepest that anything is buried is about three inches because we do run a finishing ripper that has wings on it so we undercut and then a big roller that pokes it back down and uh, so we don't incorporate any of this uh, soil or, or the organic matter three inches more than three inches into the soil and then, then a lot of it just lays on top uh, during the year anyway it's been it's been interesting because it's it's nothing that I learned in school, you know, when I was in college. Because, I mean, this system not only, you know, saves us money, and it makes us money. I mean, that's got to be the biggest test of, of anything. It's nice to have soil organic matter, but if it doesn't put anything back in your pocket, why do it? And, uh, you know, that's just something that we've seen that, I don't know, I guess it's been surprising Go, from the old days of planting a full season cotton crop, you always had to have a really good banker because you you only had one payday at the end of the year. And, uh, you know, when we harvest this grain right in the middle of the year, 
you know, surprising things happen, especially when you're not spending as much money either. And, you know, there have been a, some factors that have really been helpful, at, you know, with the eradication of the pink bollworm and the eradication of boll weevil. They were our primary uh, targets for insecticides. And several of these, uh, of our cotton fields now, they won't have a single spray on them all year. Uh, probably ligus is our biggest problem now. Uh, we may treat once or twice for ligus. Uh, that's about all that we see as a problem. I mean, it's crazy when we may have to spray our alfalfa more than we do our, our cotton now. We've still got alfalfa weevils and alfalfa caterpillars in our alfalfa, but uh, this cotton, I mean, it requires very little in the way of inputs, but we do use we do use uh, plant growth regulators in our cotton. They're very important. We found at the end of the season, and we openly tell people what our, our what our system is and and what the dates are that we've <laughs> developed to do certain things. Like uh, one of our cardinal rules is the first week of September, we apply a maximum rate of pitch, a related type material, an ethyl, uh, ethyl type material uh, to make the plant stop vegetating. We just want it to not grow anymore, to send all the photosynthate to the bowls and develop those bowls instead of uh, growing any more plant. And then, uh, and that's been key because it gets the the plant will be ready for harvest and then the other thing is that it, at this location we know we can get a little frost down here in uh, this low area next to the river uh, sometimes in uh, late October and so part of our our uh, our standard operating procedure is to make sure that every every field has uh, here I said ethereal a while ago. What I meant was the ethereal is the <laughs> is the the bowl maturing ma material. I said it wrong. Uh, the one we put on earlier is the is the mepiquot type material, the uh, the pix type material. But anyway, the uh, so the, by the 25th of October we put on a uh, eth ethereal ethypon material and uh, and a defoliant to toughen these plants up in case we do get a little early uh, early frost and, uh, and and it gets them ready I mean we, we so many of our growers here in this area grow full season cotton uh, into a, a late season as well so that they can make a, uh, the late set uh, to kick those yields up. A lot of guys in this area can make five bales uh, by growing it really late as well. But then, uh, you know, you run the risk of getting it rained on and whatever in the winter time. But we uh, uh, we get ours off as fast as anybody, basically. This is basically just a standard uh, John Deere 1700 uh, planter. And the only thing that we've added to it are these uh, Yetter uh, row cleaners. And so on the front front of it, just bolts right onto the planter. And it uh, has these fingers that pull the trash away. And it has a, a basically a straight colder. It has very little flute in it that cuts through the straw. And we absolutely have to cut all the way through it and then the fingers scrape it to one side, makes just a little pathway uh, for the seed to go in. One of the things that we do with this is that we change it a little bit from the way we would use it for planting conventional cotton in that we uh, will only have one of these gauging tires only on one side. We take the other one off. And why? Because those fields are pretty rough. and we even on one of our other planters, we even use a, a, a smaller width, only two inches wide, 
because it gives it less opportunity to run over a rough spot that lifts it out of the ground. And, uh, and it's important to keep those things sharp. I see those disc blades on that <laughs> second row. They're starting to look pretty worn. So these guys uh, need to stay on top of that and keep it uh, uh, taken care of. But we run three of these. So we've set up uh, three no-till planters because, you know, here we are on the 15th of May and we only, we want to try to finish. We won't plant past about the 5th or 6th of June. That's as late as we ever want to go. And uh, so we've got a lot of cotton to plant in a very short window. And we do the same thing with harvest. Uh, you know, we've got three six row pickers and the guys say, well, why don't you just get one of those ones that make the round module and everything. I said, well, probably because we want to get it off as fast as we can. And uh, yeah, it takes us more people, but I don't think I could afford three of those uh, big new ones because they're so, so expensive. Uh, but to have a lot of picking capacity of the old style, uh, we will eat the additional labor costs to get it off that much faster.